The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is artist Zadig Zadikian and author Linda Bladholm. Zadig Zadikian was born in Yerevan, Soviet Armenia, where he excelled with honors at the Art Academy. And in 1965, he made this daring escape, swimming through the Aroks River to Turkey. And I've seen that river. I don't know how he did it. When he got there, he attended an Istanbul Art Academy. And then the next year, he went to Beirut, where he also studied art. And in 1967, only two years after his escape, he landed at the Art Institute in San Francisco. And there he met sculptor Benjamin Bufano and the great Richard Serra's brother, Rudy. I can't believe that you did all this and that everywhere you went, you ended up in an art academy. What happened when you got from San Francisco to New York? Well, I went, uh, the first I came to uh, San Francisco <laughs> and uh, by some luck and uh, uh, met uh, a lady, a great lady in San Francisco, uh, uh, Armin Valleys, uh, who introduced me to uh, Bufano. Uh, Benny just completely uh, liked what I've done. Uh, I did in uh, Beirut. I brought some uh, pictures with me from Beirut of my sculpture pieces. And he said that I can assist him and he can teach me a great deal uh, because I was a very young man. And uh, I fell in love with his work because I knew his work from uh, showing in Moscow. He had shows in Moscow. Oh, he Benny, did. Benny, Benny had <coughs> great uh, large sculpture pieces uh, shown in there. And, uh, uh, so I loved his uh, form of work, figurative form of work, and uh, I just uh, was very happy to, to, uh, to meet this uh, great man, and uh, he was the, uh, the fantastic sculptor of the city in San Francisco then. Uh, so I, I felt very lucky, and he was a very good friend of uh, William Sarwian also, oh, and he was. adored Armenians, and when he found out my uh, uh, tragic or uh, adventurous in the past, he just uh, said, you can come and assist. And uh, I started assisting him. And uh, I had great time with uh, Benny. I learned <coughs> a great deal of mosaic and how to simplify forms and figurative sculpture and things like that. And uh, uh, But then, because of Benny, I was able to uh, have the idea of going back to Rome, Italy, and uh, doing uh, cheap casting of bronzes. Because, because of his Benny, Italian influence? Uh, Italian influence, and also Benny used to go to, uh, to Pietro Santa, uh, oh, near to Carrara. The sculpture. And sculptures, uh, enlarge his sculptures, and also uh, <coughs> he would cast and do a great deal of uh, mosaic work. They would do it for him ah, and Pietro see. Santa. Uh, so I thought, well, uh, if Benny is going there, I can you know, go also <laughs> to, uh, and have my sculptures <coughs> cast in bronze. Uh, and also I could you know, just get closer to Renaissance and uh, to all of uh, ancients and uh, Renaissance people. Uh, that's what I did. And uh, seventy, I went to the Rome, Italy to, uh, and uh, stayed in Rome or <coughs> stayed there for one year. And it's a fabulous city. I mean, uh, I don't have to <laughs> right. talk to anybody. It just, <laughs> Especially for an a, artist. Uh, I think that artists, uh, uh, especially, uh, but for anyone, really, uh, uh, it's just like in uh, the element of the time element that uh, all of Europe offers. And yet, Italy, pr uh, particularly, uh, because uh, it has this, uh, the Romans, I mean, the ancient history and everything was just outdoors and uh, old and new and uh, it was just fantastic, overwhelming and I stayed whole year. And but weren't you, were you feeling strange coming from this Soviet background? 
was this all new to you? Uh, well, it was more than new, really. It was um, uh, just like I was numbed for uh, 18 years living at the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. And then suddenly I came out. Of course, the first city that uh, was this fantastic uh, mystical city was Istanbul. Right. Uh, the minarets and the outline of Istanbul. I was living in uh, uh, Asiatic side of uh, Turkey the, in Istanbul and oh. uh, looking into the European side, all the Topkapi and all these beautiful minarets. Uh, it was like a fairy tale, uh, uh, living in uh, Iron Curtains, behind Iron Curtains for <laughs> so many years and being brainwashed that Soviet ways are the only ways. And when I came out, uh, I was completely thrown off by that's, the freedom. That's what I would uh, wonder. The cultural shock <coughs> was just beyond. And yet when I came to San Francisco, and uh, by whatever uh, means that I end up in Haight-Ashbury, where all the you know hippies, right. the hippie movement was right. starting then. Janis Joplin started you know singing on stage and uh, you know kind of a bare breast and the barefoot you know people walking you were around. <laughs> I came with suit and tie from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, <laughs> they thought that I'm KGB or uh, some kind of you know FBI you know boy, uh, and uh, it took it took me so long just to feel uh, get the feeling of what is really going on. The cultural shock was. Beyond. That's what I was wondering. And then on top of, so you left the Haight-Ashbury, which was pretty wild at that time, and then you went to New York. After Rome, you ended up in New York for several uh, years living. Right, right. So you, so you ended up with the same kind of thing in New York. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, well, in San Francisco, while I was living in San Francisco, I met Rudy Serra, Serra's brother. Right. And uh, Rudy uh, just introduced me uh, the art center being in New York. Mm. So as soon as I found out art, uh, art is happening <coughs> in New York and I wanted to be too, you know, close to the core, uh, just, I just flew you know, to New York. And, uh, and you and, worked uh, there? And then I met Richard immediately the second month and uh, he liked the energy that I was you know, uh, uh, enveloped with and uh, he said you can come and work with me Zadik. Just, oh. you know, just, and I started assisting Richard and, uh, uh, and few months we start doing his black drawings that they're oh, very famous right now yes uh, throughout the world that uh, he's been working since uh, 74 yes. doing, you know black drawings and uh, I was uh, very much involved with oh. uh, the energy <coughs> of making of the black drawings of Richards uh, then he helped me to find um, uh, of course through Richard I met all the you know the downtown New York art scene from Rushenberg to Kitsanias and uh, all of uh, you know Shafrazis and all the guys uh, that they were really cooking and uh, just burning then. But you uh, were doing some aside. You were doing your own work. You were doing p public commissions in New York, kind of public art. I always did my own work uh, day and night and. Uh, uh, Richard would come and look at what I was up to and uh, Tony would come and uh, look at what I was up to and uh, after one year uh, Richard thought that I was ready to have a show and uh, he introduced me to Jeffrey Liu 112 Green Gallery uh, ah. space in uh, uh, Soho uh, which was like uh, underground gallery space and uh, I had my first show uh, ah. at uh, Jeffrey Liu's uh, 112 Green Gallery space which I spread the whole entire gallery space into yellow. That's what traffic I, you, yellow. you did. Traffic yellow. Then you did something in gold. Gold. Uh, you broke windows. Well, <laughs> you broke uh, windows. You splattered well, I was, paint. I was, well, one one uh, one point they thought that you know I'm uh, like a Godard of that time, and uh, they just uh, after crash window at James U Gallery, I wanted to liberate art. I wanted to take art from indoors, bringing them outdoors, which I'm very much involved <laughs> still until now. Uh, right. We want to talk. <laughs> I think taking <laughs> art from indoors to indoors outdoors. Indoors to outdoors, out where you know public can see it more. To, uh, I'm going to uh, show what, and, what you're um, talking about because you have a project, and I want to be sure we talk about it before our time runs out. Uh, but your <coughs> project uh, is called Caravan. Caravan. Tell us that is taking. This is uh, just a lead into it. But that is taking the art from inside, inside. From, from gallery space or museum space to outdoors where uh, 
which will go like this. The public can see it. And also, besides being, you know, like showing to much broader public, uh, here the whole thing is it just uh, to do something in, uh, in a different context, let's see what will happen to, uh, to the art, really. Taking that preciousness away from quote unquote art that uh, <coughs> today art has become a commodity as of being you know, a precious object that they're buying and selling and all that. Well, We're let's this talk way. about this. What you'll do is take a huge canvas on a truck, seven trucks. Uh, there'll be seven trucks uh, uh, following up each other. Uh-huh. And uh, so this so would say uh, this would be number caravan. one. I'm going to go uh, through the. And then uh, there'll be uh, paintings of um, canvas paintings stretched on billboards. Mm -hmm. And those billboards will be mounted on side of the flatbed tracks. And they'll be following each other Following each other, uh, crossing from city to city, from town to town. In every town, they'll go through certain neighborhoods, very specific neighborhoods, where people in inner cities <coughs> that they never have the chance to go and see art, they'll be shown in a best way possible. Uh, and, and they'll stop in, in certain they'll areas? Stop, they'll the stop, definitely, they'll stop and uh, have outdoor exhibitions. Uh, and if uh, traffic gets to be you know, hectic or whatever, they'll just have uh, different parts of the city, uh, the whole you know, trucks will stop. And uh, they'll be going from uh, town to town, from starting from LA to Fresno, San Francisco, Sacramento, then uh, back to the San Diego and LA. And, uh, and um, will you be accompanying this outdoor exhibit? Uh, I think that more than, uh, of course, I'll be, I'll be with, uh, with this whole entourage and uh, the, the exhibition. But uh, besides me, they uh, will have a lot of camera people uh, documenting the whole thing into film. And, uh, and also, uh, there is a great deal of talk that uh, thousands of people will follow uh, from Armenian community as a pilgrimage uh -huh. uh, to uh, these miniatures that they haven't been shown uh, to the majority of the world. Uh, uh, and put on such a grand scale. Uh, we have some, some of your paintings from the Armenian miniatures. And will these type of things be put on the and a larger large, scale? Uh, they'll be enlarged and uh, they'll be enlarged and uh, put on uh, each side of the truck. <laughs> the trucks will be seven in number, so I need 14 large oh. paintings. And some of the uh, 14 large paintings might have two, three paintings on each side of the truck. Oh, so I they'll see. be divided into in different ways. Just so like a wall we'll, in a gallery. Uh, Absolutely, just, just like, a like a, a taking the walls, museum walls, right. and moving them uh, right. through the cities, and somehow going to uh, uh, against the traffic, going to, uh, through you know uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, that people can you know. Uh, Everyone experience. will have a chance to see this. Absolutely, it's so great. Absolutely. And then Zadik, once you cover California, you have to go across country. Well, that's, uh, that's the second project. I would like to establish this project first, uh, then you know, go for the next. Definitely going nationally will be a great thing to do. I think our viewers have to be very aware. Look for Zadik Zadikian. Look for this caravan that he has such foresight and such a wonderful uh, idea of doing this. I always wanted to take this a show from city to city, and you're actually doing it in such a Thanks wonderful way. Great. Congratulations. Thanks very much, John. Thank Don't you. go away, because we'll be right back with uh, chef and author Linda Bladholm. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author chef Linda Bladholm. Linda was born in San Francisco and graduated from the University of San Francisco. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Art Academy, and that accounts for the talent that can be seen in these books that she's written. Not only writing, but she's also illustrated them, and in some of her books, she's taken the photographs. Linda and I met years ago on a press trip to Australia 
you weren't doing food then, were you? No, not really. I was eating food, but I wasn't as into it as I am now. No, and I was writing for the Herald Examiner at that time. We were both kind of doing uh, writing. travel writing. Right. I worked for a travel um, magazine that's now gone under. Yeah, haven't they? <laughs> haven't many of them. Right. Exactly. Well, how did you get into cooking? Is that what pushed you into uh, it? Not exactly. I've actually always liked cooking because I come from a big family and I had to help out cooking, but I wasn't into exotic cooking. I really got more into that living in Asia and India. But then I put that on the back burner, did the travel writing thing, and in recent years, after moving to Miami, I started oh. going to Asian and Indian grocery stores to cook my own food because I missed it. I felt homesick. I see. And I would drag my husband along and he would stand there going, what is all this stuff? And I realized I have an innate knowledge from living in these countries and traveling in them of what all this stuff is that I would make a guidebook for so, people that don't know. So cooking led to shopping. Right. Led to this tri uh, triumvirate, <laughs> triumvirate trio of books, the Asian grocery store, the Asian grocery store demystified, the Indian grocery store demystified, and um, the international, international. cook, uh, is it international? It's the same thing, um, demystified. demystified the international grocery store. And they're all published by uh, Renaissance Books. It, right. And they are so great. Let's talk about the size because you can take this into the market with you. That's the whole idea. <laughs> Stick it in your purse, pull it out. When you see something you don't know, open it up, find the, look in the index, look it up. You'll see a picture. You'll find easy to understand writing that explains it in layman's terms, not fancy terms. And you also have the, um, the recipes in the back. Right, not a lot, but some of my favorite ones to try. And I tried to um, fine tune them to be rather simple and not use too many spices, ease you into it, and hopefully make you want to cook more. Now, you've done these th three books. How much do they overlap? The ingredients, um, do they overlap? I'm finding more and more. The first one, the Asian, was just the Asian. Now, the Indian, I found there is a lot of overlapping, not a lot, but um, a lot of Southeast Asian food, Thai food, obviously was very much influenced by India. So you'll find curries, coconut milk. So I, I am finding overlapping. And now I'm still working on international. I'm finding more and more using the same ingredients but mani manipulating them differently. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. Do they yes. use them in different ways? Even in India, the different regions from north to south, they'll use the same spices, but they'll use them differently in different combinations. Some are fried in oil, some are used dry, uh -huh. some are wet curries, some are dry curries. I see. So, uh, especially, I, I opened this last night because I looked at it, eggplant. I love eggplant. Me too. So you have eggplant described, uh, uh, t named the way it would be, say, in India. Mm -hmm. and, it's na and it has names four or five different names depending on where you're cooking or where you're eating. How, did you have to know the language to write these books? No, <laughs> not exactly. First, you know, I started with the English term eggplant and I went to very many grocery stores and I found I, there's like 15 different languages in India and that's where some of these oh. words come from. Each region has its own language, calls eggplant a different food. So I wanted to include as many of them as I could find because if you go to an Indian store that's run by a Gujarati, you'll have the Gujarati term. If it's from South India, it'll be the Kerala word. So just right. as much helpful information as I could find. But then also when you get to international, you're going to have different names of eggplants, Japanese, um, Turkish, Middle Eastern. That's I'm what sure. I'm working on now. <laughs> <laughs> Armenian. <It's> Armenian. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, the idea actually is to be able to pronounce them, to be able to know what they are, so that when you go into an Indian store, is it written in Indian? Um, some, it's written in the Hindi script, and it really does help. In if, script? Right. Right. Like, look at the chapter headings. You'll see that. I, mean, I did. It, I saw that, but who could understand that? Right. Well, that's why I have in the book, you look up eggplant, and maybe you'll mispronounce it a little bit, but you can read out of the book 
the term and at least one of those the owner will probably understand. Oh, and then you can go to somebody right. who can help you out. And sometimes they do have it in English, but be prepared, it's often misspelled. I found some strange spellings for certain foods. Why does a person actually need this book? Why can't they just look at a recipe and say, I need what we're talking about, five ingredients, and let's just go to the store and buy it? Well, you'll go to the store and you won't know what all that stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I wrote the book because I wanted people to get into the store and get beyond just the list of recipes in their, I mean, the list of ingredients in the recipes to go beyond that and explore and see what else is there and have fun. One of the things that um, you always see on an Indian menu is uh, the word masala. Right. And so what is masala? That simply means a mix of spices, not any particular one. There's a masala <laughs> from every region. Well, that's when I looked in your book and it's masala and there's like a list of, ingre of different uh, herbs and another list of different right, herbs. Right, because masala is like a, just a generic term for a mixture of spices. I see, I see. So that, that's explained in here. Now you did bring us today some spices. I'm going to lean over and um, show them. I think he can get a close-up on these and you can tell us what they are and do you mix them all together? You can, but this is a traditional way of how Indian people cook. They keep this by their stove. Ah. The middle one, the center one is just salt because everything is a balance of flavor so that adds the salty flavor. This is cardamom which adds a sweet and slightly peppery flavor. This can be used in both desserts and savory dishes whole or you can break it open and there's little seeds inside which you roast to bring out the flavor. This is another masala called garam masala, the most common one in the north because garam means warming, not hot and spicy, just warm. So a that means of, there's a lot of things in right, that. Right, about 10. Cinnamon, chili, mm. nutmeg, mace, mm. a lot of stuff. And uh, it's in yeah, this I can dish. Smell it. Right, okay. And this is cayenne pepper. India grows the most and exports the most. That adds your hot flavor. This is pungent and slightly bittersweet, is turmeric. This is also a preservative used in pickles. And you can rub it on fish, it kills any bacteria. Is that and right? Yes, no, yes. It's like antiseptic. Right. It is. And this is curry leaves. They smell like curry, but they they are not in any way related to curry powder. Mm. These are either sizzled in oil and poured over a dish, cooked, and when they're in a dish, you don't actually eat the leaf. You can, but it's a little bit tough, like a lemon leaf, and it adds flavor. You just push it to the side, and there's a term in India for people that use someone for a favor and then dump them. They're oh. called a curry leaf <laughs> Is that right? because it flavors the dish and then you toss and it you're aside finished with or them? finished with it. <laughs> what about this? On and top? this is good old mm. cumin seed. Probably most <clears throat> people know that. It's sort of toasty and earthy flavored. That goes into almost every single curry, either whole or ground. So if you would you you use this for cooking. Would you put right. it on the table if people were eating your food? Not really. The only one that's sprinkled over dishes is the garam masala. This isn't a cooking spice. This is sprinkled over a dish. We could sprinkle some on this now. Just adds a little flavor and aroma. You could sprinkle salt on and you could sprinkle the curry leaves. The other ones are used in cooking. The other ones are all for cooking. Right. So this is always at the sink. But you have, I mean, at the stove, stove right. at the sink and the stove. Oh, right. But you have to go to the market and buy each one of these things. Right, and you can buy them either whole or ground. Indian people prefer to buy them whole. You toast them dry in a frying pan and grind them either by hand in a mortar or in a spice grinder. I see. Okay, you brought something else with you. You brought, hold that up, please. This and is tell a raita. Is. This is a cool. This is one of the few cooling dishes you have between all the hot and spicy foods. It's yogurt with sliced up cucumbers, toasted cumin seeds, and a little pinch of salt w garnished with mint leaves. And then what do you do with that? Just put it on the plate with the it's rest a, of the food? It's eaten along with all the other food as a side dish or a salad. Okay, and I have this, which is? The Jardaloo Murgi. It's apricot chicken. And you s I used chicken breast for this, but normally you could use bone-in chicken, like legs and thighs, because the bones add more flavor. You saw, um, first you marinate 
the meat in a mixture of ground up ginger, a little bit of cayenne, and garlic. Let it marinate a couple hours. Then you brown it in a little oil, set it aside. Then you saute about two onions with about you know, five tomatoes. And till it turns into a sauce, takes about 20 minutes. Then you add back the chicken and soaked apricots. Oh, where did the apricots come right. from? Right. What were they in? Just in water soaking? Right. Oh, you soak them first. If you use Indian apricots, or the ones that come from Pakistan, they're very shriveled and hard. You have to soak those a couple um, hours. But um. I used California apricots, so about half an hour. Yeah, wonderful. Right. Oh, Sweet, they're delicious. Wonderful. <laughs> so it adds like a sweet and sour, tangy and spicy mixture. And I just sprinkled some curry leaves over for color and for a little bit of extra flavor. But, you were, but we're not supposed to eat these curry leaves. You can, but most people t put them to they the side. They push them to the side. Right. Now, when you go to an Indian restaurant, do you have your favorites? Yeah, I do, but unfortunately it's hard to find them on most menus because most menus are northern style and I prefer I southern style. I see. But I'm starting to see more and more southern foods. So in your um, Indian grocery store, Demystified, will we be seeing more southern kind of recipes? Um, no, I cover both. I tried to be balanced, even though I'm biased <laughs> towards the south. <laughs> and where do you shop? Um, do you find Indian stores everywhere? Yeah, in researching this book, I found out <coughs> there's actually over 9,000 in this country. And there's a lot in LA, there's a lot in San Francisco, there's quite a few in Miami where I live, there's a ton in Chicago, there's a ton in New York. Ah. And you'll find them in little places like Tulsa, Oklahoma. The newspaper there interviewed me and I was shocked. They said they have like three or four Indian grocery stores. So. There's a lot of Indian people in this country, and they like to eat their food. So <laughs> some of them are small, some of them are huge, but you'll find the markets almost everywhere. Well, before we leave, do we see Linda Bladholm, um, the Asian grocery dis dis demystified, the Indian grocery demystified? Do we find you opening a restaurant, serving oh, all these things? That's my dream, but <laughs> if anyone has any uh, upstart capital out there, I'm ready to start cooking. Well, we'll be looking for you. Oh, thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Linda, and thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 40th, 44th floor, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.